the air with Florida just now getting to see the damage from Nicole. The second storm to hit that state just six weeks now after Hurricane Ian, the first. At least two people are dead. Hundreds of thousands don't have power. We'll take you to the spots just starting to rebuild. Plus, the best day for the Dow in two years, we found out just about a half hour ago, off some pretty decent news on inflation. But that's not why President Biden showed up to celebrate at an event in D.C. More on why he's calling this week good for America. And speaking of this week, this midterms week, becoming a midterms month, by the way, we could get a clearer picture later on tonight of which party is in the driver's seat to control the Senate with key ballot updates coming in from Arizona and Nevada. We're live in both for a vibe check from the candidates. Plus, it's the anniversary of one of the most heinous acts of the Holocaust. And one woman is using her big platform on TikTok to fight misinformation and to teach Gen Z. That's tonight's original. And we're going behind the scenes on what one of our reporters says is literally the coolest thing she's ever seen. Why she's so psyched about an entire town of 3D printed houses. We'll have that in the backstory later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and right now, as Tropical Storm Nicole heads north after hammering Florida, it's showing everybody in its path that even though it's not a hurricane anymore, it is still very dangerous. And now we're finding out deadly with two people killed, according to officials in Orange County, after they were electrocuted by a downed power line. So now you've got places like Georgia, North Carolina bracing for impact because look at this. Just look at what the storm did in Florida today. You see those homes, some parts of those houses in Daytona Beach, just straight up falling off. You see it there into the ocean. We're also seeing some new pictures of how Nicole may have even unearthed a Native American burial ground with heavy rain, winds and flooding that has people wondering how much more they can take. Nicole is the nail in the coffin for Daytona Beach Shores. Ian came in and did all this damage. And now Nicole is just putting us away. We also have more than 230,000 people at this moment who do not have power. And if all of this feels like deja vu, it's because it kind of is. Nicole is hitting Florida, as you heard reference there from that person, just six weeks after Hurricane Ian arrived in that state as a Category 4. Sam Brock joins me right now. And Sam, um, listen, I'm looking at your live shot here. It may not be super windy where you are, but the damage is there as the state is still dealing, not just like with the physical cleanup from Ian, but from Ian rather, but with the sort of emotional impact too. Yeah, the psychological impact. Look, Hallie, Hurricane Ian was a generationally horrific hurricane. It's going to leave its imprint on Florida for years to come. Now, as far as it concerns Hurricane Nicole, I'm in Indian River County right now. This is Vero Beach. This area is going to be fine in a couple of weeks when you talk about Martin County or St. Lucie County nearby. But there's still been some damage here, and people are still trying to digest what they've just seen over the last month and a half. This here is a boardwalk. Now, again, landfall occurred not far from where I'm standing. There wasn't a ton of damage, but this boardwalk, buckled and look at this okay this is a sidewalk this is a chunk of sidewalk that i would have been walking over just a day ago and now it is sitting on the sand as we rise up i'm going to show you a little bit farther down this area where we've spoken so much about erosion hallie like people in volusia county have got to be thinking right now are you kidding me Check out this drone footage that we got earlier today from Volusia. There are homes that have either fallen into the ocean or are sitting on the precipice, largely because when Hurricane Ian came in, it dug away so much of the sand dunes and really the sort of material that buttresses and, and safeguards against erosion. That all got ripped away. We're seeing that on a much smaller scale here in Vero Beach. This road, again, used to be a street. Look at what I'm seeing right now. Okay, It is essentially caved out, pulled out yeah. from underneath here. There's pavement that is sticking over. Hallie, one woman told me that her car was parked right here 24 hours ago. The car was here. Now there's, there's nothing here. So I spoke with people and I asked them, this is a Category 1 hurricane. What are your reactions to seeing this 24 hours later? Here's what they told me. Surprise that in one evening that that dune and the amount of sand could be wiped out. It's gone. Like I said, I, if somebody tried to describe this to me without me seeing it, I, I couldn't imagine it. I want to leave you at least with a bit of a positive note on this, Hallie, which is there's a gorgeous rainbow right now that is yes. about to emerge from underneath here. Follow me for a second and you will see it as we are on the Treasure Coast right now. And in case you're wondering why this is called the Treasure Coast, it's because wow. of all the pirate ships that used to, to wash up here. And so after there's major storms like this, apparently I am told you will come out here and find treasure and precious metals. I've seen people with metal detectors on this beach today hoping to fulfill that dream. So at least there's a silver lining, pun intended, to all of this.
I like on the ground, but also in the sky, Sam, where that unbelievable rainbow is yes. sort of perfectly symbolizing this moment, at least for Floridians, even as people up north um, are bracing for, for more wind and more rain from this storm. Sam Brock, thank you. That was a nice thing to end on a positive note. Appreciate that. Let me bring in meteorologist Bill Karens, too. Bill, we'll, we'll talk about that rainbow later on, but let, let's talk about where Nicole is headed, <laughs> right? Because we know the people are getting ready, as we're talking about. Give us the forecast. Give us the track. Yes. And give us the timing factor here, too, because, listen, this is late to see a hurricane hit the United States. Yeah, um, it's been a wild day in Florida, you know, for heading into the middle of November. And we still have a high tide cycle this evening. Right around 9 o'clock is the time we're worried about for all those low-lying areas from Savannah, Hilton Head, up to Charleston. That's the area of concern. So it's not going to do a lot of wind damage. Power's actually been restored to almost 100,000 people in Florida. We peaked at right around 350,000. Right now we're about a quarter of a million people without power. We still have a chance of isolated tornadoes. That's this little pink box here. That includes areas around Hilton Head, Savannah, down to Brunswick, Georgia. Just so far, so good, though. We haven't had any reports of tornadoes. And as far as tracking the rest of the storm, it's going to move up through Georgia as we go throughout tonight. Tomorrow morning, be just to the east of Atlanta, heading over towards Augusta and the mountains of upstate South Carolina. So here's the timing on this. Where you see the yellow and reds, that's the downpour. So that's at 8 p.m. this evening. On and off heavy rain in Atlanta. They're going to try to play that football game in the rain in Charlotte tonight. And then we're going to wake up to rain, especially in the Appalachians. On and off heavy downpours around D.C. New York City looks like around 1 p.m. Is when the heavy rain moves around your area. And then as we fast forward, this D.C. continues to get rain. Looks like Washington, D.C., your rain is done by about midnight Friday. So your Saturday and Sunday is dry. You wake up to dry conditions in New York City at 8 a.m. Boston, you're going to have to wait till about noon or so. And then everything should be gone by about 2 p.m. as we go throughout Saturday afternoon. So the biggest concerns, obviously, if we're going to have any damage or life-threatening weather, it would be from tornadoes spawned from Nicole. Got it. We're really targeting the rest of today and tonight in the Carolinas. Bill Karens, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Let's turn to the markets now, which a lot of green today, right? Normally we're coming on, we're talking red, something's happened. Guess what? Something has happened. And it is an inflation report that is giving investors a lot of optimism that maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Look at this. Green, green, green. Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, not just all up, but the Dow ending the day up 3.5%. Single best day, right? Single biggest gain for the Dow in two years, the S&P and the NASDAQ having their best days since April of 2020, since the pandemic really smoked the markets. Um, yes, the overall price of stuff is still going up, right? Inflation is still a concern. Things are getting more expensive, but they're not getting as expensive as quickly. Okay, that is what we found out from these new numbers that are out today. What does it mean? It means that the Fed maybe is onto something with these interest rate hikes, that maybe those are actually working. Joining us now, Brian Chung. And, and Brian, talk us through what this means, the tick down in the inflation going up and why that's so significant. Yeah, and by the way, I watch markets very closely. You almost never see movements that dramatic. But look, all this is on the back of this number right here. This is the inflation report that showed prices increasing in October by 7.7% compared to the year prior. That's a slower pace than the 8.2% we saw in September and also slower than the 9.1% that we had seen earlier in the year. Now, again, I want to show you, though, the overall picture here when we take a look at a chart. This is the year-over-year -year changes over the last year or so. We're still very far away, even though it ticked down just a little bit to 7.7% from the 2% that economists say we really want to be at in terms of getting inflation back down to a more comfortable level. So the Federal Reserve's job certainly not done and the expectation, indeed, that they'll have to to continue to raise interest rates to get this a little bit closer to here. Well, people want to see it like if you're going to fill out the rest of that graph, people want to see it go like this, you know, what I mean? like way yeah. down here. Yeah. Um, timing wise, if the Fed is going to continue to make some of these rate hikes, how soon can we start to see that number get to where people are more comfortable with how their monthly budgets are looking when they go to the grocery store or pay for gas. Yeah, and one talking point, by the way, is that the Fed began hiking rates around here in March, and the talking point is it takes about six to nine months for those okay. interest rate in increases <laughs> to take impact. So we'll have to see. Maybe that could be sometime next year. Remains to be seen. We did see some price declines in some categories, by the way, apparel, footwear, and washer dryers. So maybe at least some good news on that front. Brian Chung, great to see you. Thank you. President Biden taking a little bit of a victory lap right here in Washington today because of what Brian has been talking about. Mike Memoli is joining us now, our White House correspondent. And Mike, this was not an, you know, inflation is going down event, right? This was a <laughs> midterms have happened and let's go talk about politics. But you got to think that any news is good news. Any good news is going to be news for the White House. They're going to want the president to talk about it. 
And better late than never, right? I mean, obviously, this is a report that they would have loved to have seen a couple of weeks ago Before, heading into yeah. those midterm elections. Uh, but as the president was taking a victory lap today, as you call it, broadly talking about what we saw in the elections, he also did uh, highlight this report. Let's take a listen to what the president had to say. Mainstream economists are saying this is a really positive sign of the resilience of, of the economic recovery. It's going to take time to get inflation back to normal levels. We can see setbacks along the way. I realize that. But we are laser focused on it. And so it is better late than never for most Democrats, but particularly now for Raphael Warnock, right? We still have one more election to go. And we heard from the White House today about that race. Karine Jean-Pierre saying that the White House is prepared to do whatever Raphael Warnock wants them to do in that runoff election in just a few weeks. Ron Klain yesterday saying we're going to deploy whatever resources we can down there. One right. question, will it be the president? We haven't seen him in Georgia in quite some time. And, you know, I asked uh, a White House, a top White House official about this today who told me exactly the same thing, right? Well, if they ask... We'll go. And I said, well, have they asked? You know, um, and then, of course, the pivot on that front. You are reporting more not just on this piece of it, but about how not just the economy, but abortion was part of how some advisors are describing a one-two punch in the midterm strategy here. Talk us through that, because you are our insider here, and a lot of sources are kind of laying out what this plan was. And really, what I wanted to do was revisit a conversation I had with one of the top strategists at the White House just around August when they were preparing to really launch this midterm offensive. And at the time, they were saying, yes, we are going to talk a lot about the economy. They know it was going to be a headwind that they were facing, but they felt that they can at least neutralize that as an issue. But then also really pressing the advantage that they felt that they were going to have on Dobbs. And remember, this White House was questioned quite often about that strategy, right? The question of whether they were focused too much on the economy, not enough on the economy. Was he talking about abortion when he should have been talking about other issues. Well, in the end, there's a lot of we told you so in the White House, at least among some of the senior advisors. But I'll tell you, Hallie, I was talking to some of the more junior staff. As one put it to me, you know, obviously the president's always optimistic, but even some of the advisors who were talking a big game about the, their confidence said we thought one of them was high on hopium, as they put it. Now, of course, they're very happy with what they see, because as the president put it, the best midterm for a Democratic first term incumbent in really 40 years. Ma'am, what better way to live life than high on hopium? You know what I mean? <laughs> I uh, Mike Memoli, yep. live for us there outside the White House. Thank you. So as insiders are telling Mem about the president's one-two punch, we are getting a one-two punch from Georgia's Senate candidates today, both of them back on the campaign trail ahead of the runoff in early December, hoping to convince voters, yes, come back out. Come back out and vote for us again on December 6th. In the next hour or so, we're going to see Herschel Walker, the Republican candidate here running for Senate, hoping to get a boost at a rally with Senator Ted Cruz, who is coming in to a county um, that Walker won two to one in the election. Senator Raphael Warnock is out there, too, meaning election day this week. Senator Raphael Warnock is out, too. You see all the signs that say one more time. Warnock's calling this runoff a choice about competence and character. And we know how important the Georgia Senate race is going to be. One of the three uncalled battlegrounds for the Senate. These three states on your screen will decide which party stays in power. You can see how close it is. 49 projected seats for Republicans at the moment, 48 for Democrats at the moment. moment. Will Georgia, Arizona, or Nevada change the game? We don't know because NBCUs just cannot make that call yet. Or over in the House because um, the graphic we're about to show you, kind of confusing here. This is our projection of what our decision desk thinks could happen. So you see the Republicans have an edge, but it's not a total guarantee. In fact, it is totally not a guarantee because we, we just skipped past it, plus minus seven. That's the margin, right? That is the margin of error here. You see they're inside of it. What we're showing you now are the uncalled races in the House. So many ballots need to be counted. This really can go either way. We are live in Arizona and Nevada tonight, so let's start with Guad Venegas, who is in Las Vegas. Um, and Guad, one of the things that we're seeing, we knew that Nevada was going to be a slow count, meaning it was going to take some time to count the ballots. Now you have this baseless conspiracy that former President Trump is trying to spread, that maybe there's something nefarious going on here. Um, Clark County officials, again, no evidence of that at all. And in fact, Clark County officials had to come out today and say, like, no, no. We're moving as fast as we can, but there are deadlines. There are reasons why we can't speed things up on this front. Talk us through it. Uh, Hallie, so Donald Trump uh, called the system in Clark County uh, corrupt. Remember, Donald Trump lost the election 
in Nevada two years ago in the presidential election. In fact, I was here reporting uh, two years ago when we were waiting for the votes here to be counted. So it has been a slow uh, process here. You know, one of the things that Joe Gloria also said is this is only the second time that they do these uh, mail-in votes. So it definitely has been, uh, there's been a learning curve uh, here for officials. He says they're moving as fast as they can. And this is the message that he sent out answering uh, to Donald Trump. Obviously, he's misinformed two years later about the law and our election processes. We couldn't go any faster now, even if we wanted to. So during the press conference, uh, he was asked if the, perhaps they needed more space in Clark County for more machines and more workers so that the process could go faster. But he insisted he insisted on focusing that the staff that he has and the machines that they have are enough. And in fact, he says that because the votes can keep coming in through Saturday, he cannot move uh, faster than he's moving. So what we know is that there's those 50,000 plus, so about 50,000 votes. That includes the drop boxes and the mail-in votes. And that is what it still needs to be tabulated and what we expect to get results from in the next coming days here in Clark County, Hallie. Squad, thanks for being there in Vegas. The reason why the former president's election fraud lies matter so much, right? The reason that it is important to talk about the lack of evidence for some of those claims is because in Arizona, Republican candidates on the ballot are pushing those same lies, right? One of the loudest elections in Ayers is the candidate for governor, Kerry Lake, who is currently trailing the Democrat in this gubernatorial race by more than 16,000 votes right now. This is so close. This is super duper close, the governor's race. And then here's the Senate race, where the gap is actually a little bit bigger, still obviously not a called race by NBC News, no projection here. But you see Democrat incumbent Senator Mark Kelly is up right now by something like 100,000 over Blake Masters, his challenger, again, also an election denier. Aaron McLaughlin is live for us in Phoenix. Aaron, we may actually be getting a little bit of news, um, like not a decision maybe, but news in the next little bit here. Talk us through what we can expect to see tonight. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. We are expecting a press conference here in Maricopa County updating everyone on the situation, this process that is ongoing. I was speaking to an election official just a short while ago was telling me that there's about 400,000 estimated ballots to still be waiting to be tabulated here in Maricopa County, the largest county in Arizona. Of those 400,000 ballots, 290,000 of them are mail-in ballots that were brought to voting centers in person on election day. Those, even though they were dropped off in person, are still being treated as mail-in ballots, and they have to go through this very lengthy signature verification process. That, just beginning today, speaking to this election official, he told me that he expects by end of day today some of those results to be in, but the bulk of those results are expected to be announced tomorrow when they hope to have about 95 percent of this process done here in Maricopa County. Now, that is the picture here. There's also, of course, the situation in Pima County, the second largest county in Arizona. Their tabulation, their ballot counting continues. There's about 160,000 ballots outstanding out there. Kelly. Aaron, explain why Senator Mark Kelly's campaign seems to be feeling pretty good about where the numbers are right now, even with what you just laid out, the fact that there is still a lot of vote yet to be counted. Yeah, well, he has, at this point, a 99,000 vote, roughly speaking, advantage. It's looking increasingly difficult for Blake Masters, his opponent, to sort of overcome that deficit, given the state of play so far. But it's worth also noting, Hallie, that given how close these races are, you know, all sides at this point say that they're feeling confident, including Katie Hobbs, who's in a neck-and-neck -neck race uh, with Carrie Lake. I do have a statement, by the way, from uh, Mark Kelly's campaign talking about their confidence. We continue to be confident that we will win this race and are grateful for Arizona's election officials working around the clock to count outstanding ballots across the state. This measured statement in stark contrast to some of the things that we're hearing from Carrie Lake's campaign, Carrie Lake yeah. herself tweeting, calling for the Arizona election process to be overhauled. She's really counting on that 290,000 ballot ballots that were dropped off in person in those voting centers. She's tweeting about it today, counting on that uh, to make up the difference for her. Aaron McLaughlin live for us there in 
Maricopa County and Phoenix. Aaron, thanks. So public health experts are saying tonight that fears of a winter triple demic, the concern that COVID flu and RSV would smack us really hard. Guess what? It might be happening. Look at Missouri today. Check this out. A brand new drive through testing site, multiple testing sites for these three sicknesses. It looks an awful lot like what we saw in the early days of the pandemic, obviously very different, um, given that it is far less widespread, far less deadly, of course, now with vaccines for two of those three diseases we just mentioned. But healthcare workers there are hoping to help catch parents, catch hoping to help parents catch the virus before symptoms get severe. Why? Hospitals are packed. They are strained. 75% of children's hospitals' beds are full in nearly 30 states across the country. Look at this map. You've got some hospitals even delaying some pediatric surgeries to free up beds. Schools are also having a tough time. In Kentucky, dozens of districts have had to close now for days to help prevent not just RSV and the flu from spreading, but strep throat, too. Maggie Vespa joins us live now from a testing site in St. Louis. Maggie, talk us through what you're seeing. Well, Hallie, they're just wrapping up after a long day of doing nasal swabs that, as you described, are really reminiscent of sort of peak pandemic, like those routines that were kind of haunting when they first started, when COVID first hit. But what's even sort of more striking here, as you pointed out, there are several differences. One of them, though, parents say, when we were talking about COVID, we were talking about adults. We weren't swabbing kids in mass. And these are viruses that are really hitting kids and hence those pediatric hospital numbers that you pointed out. That being said, there is some comfort here. Parents getting information on which virus is impacting their kid. Listen to what a nurse said earlier about just kind of the routine um, of this option for people here today. Most people are more comforted just knowing that they could come do a quick test and, and get an answer rather than having to like sit wait in, in a line yeah, wait in line or sit in a hospital or an urgent care. And I feel like it's a, just a fast, easy way for the community to stay safe. Yes, yeah, so that is a great option to have. I should note, though, I talked to a doctor uh, last week about this and she described it again, as the reverse pandemic, a doctor, another doctor telling us specific to pediatric beds, she has never seen a situation like this, including during the pandemic, where because of widespread illness, kids' hospital beds are running low or running out. And that is wow. what we're seeing, Hallie. You talk about kids with RSV. 24 hours ago, right here on this show, Maggie, we showed this video that was rather extraordinary of an yeah. officer rushing in to try to give CPR to a little baby girl who had, we're seeing it here right now, who had gone basically um, limp, wasn't breathing because of RSV, having a severe, severe reaction here. You can see the rescue here. You have an update for us tonight, and it's it's good news. Yeah, thankfully. So that little girl's name is Kamaya, and we spoke to her mom as well as those hero police officers who swooped in with that CPR, performing it for 30 seconds. They were, thankfully, and you can see it in that video, able to revive her um, after doing CPR on that tiny baby who was born premature. So she's there a month she old, is. but she's still a preemie, and hence the, hence the severe reaction. And there is her homecoming. That's mom bringing Kamaya home after a week in the hospital where she was on a ventilator, but again, oh. alive and well and recovering thanks to those officers. Absolute heroes, Hallie. That's amazing. Uh, Maggie Vespa, thank you very much for bringing that to us. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, more trouble ahead maybe for the Washington Commanders and the NFL after the D.C. Attorney General today is filing a civil lawsuit against the team, against its controversial owner, and against the league. How the AG here in D.C. says they colluded to deceive and mislead fans just to make money. Plus, conspiracy theorist Alex Jones now being ordered to pay half a billion dollars more to the families of Sandy Hook victims. What he's promising to do in response coming up. The attorney general for Washington, D.C., announcing today that his office is filing a civil lawsuit against the Washington football team's controversial owner, Dan Snyder. The team itself, the commanders, the NFL, the NFL league owner, saying that they lied about a toxic workplace culture inside the commander's organization that's been the subject of investigation for years. Listen. The defendants lied about what they knew, and then they lied about what they were going to do about it, all in the service of protecting image and profit. Carl Racine saying Snyder, Dan Snyder, the owner, was not only aware of allegations of a hostile work environment, but he, and I'm quoting here, encouraged it and participated in it. 
and said that Snyder was given information about the investigation and the NFL turned a blind eye at his push to try to prevent witnesses from testifying. So what is the response from Dan Snyder? His reps referring NBC News to the commanders who say they welcome the opportunity to defend the organization. The NFL calling the AG's claims baseless. That's what they've said, saying they would vigorously defend against them. Uh, Roger Goodell, the commissioner, has declined to comment. Mark Seagraves from our NBC station right here in Washington joins me now uh, just down the street from us there outside the AG's office in town. So, um, Mark, the attorney general is calling this a consumer protection lawsuit where the complaint basically says that the defendants lied about what was happening to make money from football fans in Washington who they hoped would keep you know, pouring money into the pockets of the league and Dan Snyder, et cetera. Walk us through this a little bit. Yeah, good evening, Holly. So the Washington team uh, does not play in Washington. They don't have offices in Washington. They don't practice in Washington. And that's why <laughs> this point. is a civil suit and not a criminal suit. And Attorney General Carl Racine has been prolific in using the district's Consumer Protection Act to go after big and small companies, local and national. So it's not unusual uh, or out of the blue for him to go after the Washington commanders and the NFL. And at the heart of this is that an owner of a business who provides service to district residents cannot lie about their business in order to make profits. And that's what the allegation is, that Dan Snyder and the NFL and Roger Goodell in their cover-up attempt, and that's what Racine is saying they did, they covered up the findings of this NFL investigation in order to further their profits. This could result in fines that, uh, or a settlement, Racine says, that, that could be into the millions of dollars. Each mm. instance of uh, a transgression would be a fine. $5,000 fine. Now, Racine would not extrapolate how many instances that there are, but he said if there were to be a settlement, there would be lots and lots of zeros uh, involved in that number. And he pointed to a, a recent settlement with another company that had a similar uh, case brought against them, and that settlement was for $10 million. He says that he will seek subpoenas for both Goodell and Snyder to testify under oath about what they knew and what was going on inside the organization. Mark, you know as well as I do that the parlor game du jour here in Washington is who is going to buy the commanders potentially from Dan Snyder. He is putting the team, all indications are, up for sale, bringing in a big bank. Uh, that's been the reporting lately. How, how would a sale of the commanders by Snyder affect this lawsuit? Could, could he still face fallout from it, even if he doesn't still own the team? Absolutely. That question was put to Attorney General Racine, okay. and he said that it does not matter who owns the team, that both the team, the NFL, and Snyder would still be on the hook for this lawsuit it goes for further, as it goes forward, regardless of who owns the team or whether Snyder is still attached to the team at the time this would get to court. We saw, but this has been a lot of tension between the team, between the city, even before this um, announcement just a few hours ago from the AG, because there was this kind of pre buttle late last night when a spokesperson invoked the shooting of one of the commander's players, which was very high profile, just down the street here in Washington, um, is part of a sort of broader conversation around the AG. There's a lot of reaction to this, some backlash, kind of a cleanup. Tell us more about that piece of it. Yeah, that really blew up in the team's face. They put out this statement, and one of the quotes was that the attorney general should be more concerned with, quote, the out-of-control violence in the District of Columbia and finding the people uh, who shot Brian Robinson, uh, the player for the team. And that was such an ill-informed statement because, one, two people have already been arrested. Two of the three suspects are already in custody uh, for that shooting. And the attorney general in D.C. does not prosecute these kinds of violent crimes. The most they, they do some juvenile crimes, but most of the crimes are these civil crimes, these consumer crimes. We have the U.S. Attorney's Office who actually pursues the more violent crimes, uh, shootings, murders, carjackings, things of that nature. The uh, uh, the agent for Brian Robinson was the first one to weigh in on social media, saying how disappointed he was in the team for uh, conflating the two: the, the shooting of, of 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 his player and this lawsuit or investigation into the team. It didn't take long for the team to actually distance himself from that statement, putting out another statement saying that was actually a statement uh, by the attorney and not from the team. Mark Seagraves covering all of it for us uh, tonight in Washington. Mark, it's good to see you. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Taliban now banning women 
from using gyms or going to parks in Afghanistan. A spokesperson from the Ministry of Virtue and Vice said they're being banned because people were ignoring gender segregation orders. This is the Taliban's latest crackdown on women's rights and freedoms since they took power more than a year ago. Number two, a judge in Connecticut ordering Alex Jones, noted conspiracy theorist, and his company to pay about half a billion more to victims, families, and an FBI agent for calling the Sandy Hook school shooting a hoax. That's on top of the nearly billion-dollar jury verdict from last month. Jones says he's going to appeal all these verdicts. Number three, one person has died, one woman lost her pregnancy, and more than a dozen other people got sick in a listeria outbreak, believed to be linked to deli meat and cheese, according to the CDC. Public health officials say anybody at higher risk of getting really sick from listeria should not eat deli meat or deli cheese unless it's reheated to 165 degrees, like steaming hot. The reported illnesses happened in six states between April 2021 to this past September. Number four, if you've always wanted a blue check mark on Twitter, you can buy it now for $7.99. That's because Twitter started rolling out a new version of its blue subscription service, which lets users pay for that check mark. Twitter owner Elon Musk said he's hoping to cut back on how many harmful accounts are on the platform. We're going to have more on what, what else is going on at Twitter in a little bit, because like we certainly can't get through it in 20 seconds. Number five, a new study has found meditation is actually as effective as medication for anxiety. Researchers. At Georgetown University here in D.C. say that in their eight-week clinical trial, they found that practicing mindful meditation was just as helpful for anxiety symptoms as taking a daily pill. It is the first ever study to directly compare the two methods. Do you meditate? Let me tell you. Try it. You might dig it when we come back. President Biden set to meet face to face in person with Chinese President Xi Jinping for the first time since President Biden has taken office. And it comes, boy, at a really critical time. We'll talk about the red lines for both sides ahead of the G20 coming up in just a minute. It is now official as of today that in a couple days from now, you will see a key meeting at a key moment. President Biden face to face with China's leader, Xi Jinping, right before the G20 summit in Bali, the White House, saying that the two leaders, that President Biden is going to work to keep the lines of communication open between the U.S. and China. They'll talk about, you know, regional, global issues. It's like the typical stuff that you hear from White House officials before a meeting like this. But here's the real deal. This meeting is happening at kind of a low point in the relationship between D.C. and Beijing, one of the lowest points this relationship has been in decades. In the last 24 hours, President Biden said he wasn't going to make any fundamental concessions over U.S. support for Taiwan. That is a huge wedge issue between these two countries. China wants to basically fold Taiwan back into sort of its universe there. They don't want the U.S. having anything to do with Taiwan. The U.S. has a very different view. Keir Simmons is joining us now. It's not just Taiwan, Keir. President Biden um, has said he's looking for competition, not conflict. But Xi Jinping is fresh off a party meeting where he is getting an unprecedented third term as president. Both of these leaders um, kind of have a lot to lose, a little less to gain in this meeting Monday. Yeah. That's right, Halle. They don't expect a meeting of like minds, but do expect a meeting between two leaders who, frankly, are in an extremely strong position right now, stronger certainly than they might have been if they had uh, met just a, a few months ago. As you mentioned, uh, President Xi uh, now has a, another term in office, unprecedented uh, in China, uh, unless you go back to uh, Chairman Mao. And then just imagine if this meeting had taken place after the midterms and uh, President Biden had suffered a serious defeat there. Well, well, then he would have been a very different president meeting with the Chinese uh, leader. Now, what President Biden is saying, Hallie, that he wants to, uh, to talk about is Taiwan, is human rights in Xinjiang with the uh, Uyghur uh, minority uh, there. He does also uh, want to talk about you know, economic uh, competition and the allegations of unfair practices by the, by the Chinese. I mean, the list goes on. It could be a long meeting, because there are ways in which the U.S. and China uh, need to communicate. I think that's what President Biden is looking for, trying to find a ground that they can, well, perhaps not agree on, but at least have a conversation on. Yeah. Climate change is one of them, but there are many others. And I think Russia will be one of the questions that President Biden will be wanting to ask President Xi. 
How much support are you giving for President Putin? And, and are you ensuring in your relationship with President Putin that you are uh, trying to control the Russians to, a, to an extent and certainly try to ensure that they didn't at any point choose to use nuclear weapons? Of course, Putin will not be at the G20 himself because we're now learning he's going to skip it yeah. altogether. His foreign minister will go instead. This would have been the first time that he and the president, President Biden, would have been at the, at the same meeting since Russia invaded Ukraine. Why is Putin not showing up? Oh, I'm not surprised he's not going, Hallie. He, he had, frankly, an impossible choice, an impossible choice of his own making, of course. But imagine if he had turned up. And he right. had given a speech, and uh, Western dem dem leaders of democracies and allies uh, had walked out of the room as, right. as had been threatened. The message How embarrassing that for President Putin would that have been? So he couldn't win. I mean, he couldn't win by going. Uh, I think by not going, of course, uh, the trouble is that he, at the same time, uh, displays uh, a certain level of of weakness, uh, certainly. Remember, it was at a, a G20 uh, that President Putin uh, fist bumped with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, after when, when, when uh, pre the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia was in an incredibly uh, difficult uh, position. Uh, and, and now President Putin can't even manage to even go. I mean, it does say a lot. Kier Simmons live for us overseas. Kier, thank you. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, KFC is apologizing after sending a message to customers in Germany telling them to commemorate Kristallnacht with cheesy chicken. For a reminder here, Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, is a historical event when Nazis killed close to 100 Jews, burned down synagogues, and vandalized Jewish homes in 1938. So you can imagine why people were horrified, horrified to see KFC promoting a chicken sandwich to commemorate this day. The fast food chain saying the push notification was an error and apologized for the insensitive message. All of it coming at a time when anti-Semitism is on the rise, when Holocaust denial is rampant. About 16 percent of Holocaust-related content posted on social media either denied or distorted the Holocaust, according to a UNESCO report. One social media influencer now is using her platform to educate her followers about what happened. Savannah Sellers has the story. This is what you probably know Montana Tucker for. She's a spirited dancer and singer with nearly 9 million followers on TikTok. But now she's sharing something extremely personal with her fans. Tell me a little bit about your family. Anyone that knows me knows I always have been extremely, extremely close to my grandparents. I even wear my Zadie's ring and never take it off. Her grandfather, or Zadie, and her grandmother are Holocaust survivors. Back in June, Tucker traveled to Poland to retrace their roots. I'm going to be taking you guys along this journey with me. She's posting what she learned as a documentary series on TikTok and Instagram, calling it How to Never Forget. I never really realized until maybe like after my Zadie passed away that this is now my responsibility to get out there because who's going to speak for them? In a few years, there are going to be no more Holocaust survivors left. A 2020 nationwide survey of millennials and Gen Zers found 63% of those surveyed did not know that 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. Tucker's goal is to change that. This is now my responsibility to educate. Do you know how many thousands of bodies are here? In excess of 400,000 bodies buried in the in the mass graves on either side. Tell me about deciding to do this project, to take this trip, and then to share it with millions of people. It was the hardest week of my life, but the most necessary. And especially when I came home and really got to sit with my thoughts and, and realize, wow, I can't believe I just did that. It couldn't come at a more crucial time. Her first of 10 episodes happened to drop right as the controversy around Kanye West anti-Semitic comments sparked outrage. If my Zadie was still alive to hear what is going on now, I can't even imagine how he would feel. In 2021, the Anti-Defamation League counted a total of 2,717 anti-Semitic incidents across the U.S., a 34% increase from 2020 and the highest number since the ADL began tracking back in 1979. Holocaust denial is a form of anti-Semitism. We've seen it um, spread recently on social media platforms. And so what influencers like Montana Tucker and others who use their platform for good are doing is, is really helping followers to become like attached to their personal story. That's exactly what Rachel Kastner, the producer of Tucker's project, is hoping for. Somebody saying that they barely learned about the Holocaust in their high school and they're so glad that Montana is teaching them about it. Like that's impact. 
that's impact. Kastner is also the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Going back with Montana to produce this project, when we were standing in Auschwitz on our last day of filming, we literally looked at each other and said our grandparents would be so proud. A sentiment Tucker holds close to her heart. I feel like my Zadie and I, like, it just had the most special relationship that, like, you can't even, sorry. No, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> I know he would be so proud of me for doing this. Obviously, this is such an emotional journey for her that she's sharing with literally millions of people. Now, here's a big point, Hallie. Many states do not require Holocaust education. So both Montana Tucker, as well as her producer in that piece, Rachel Kastner, stress the idea here is to get this information, this educational information to children, to young adults in the places where they are consuming so much information constantly with the hope of combating that anti-Semitism. Back to you, Hallie. Our thanks to Savannah Sellers for that um, critically important story at an important time. Thank you. Coming up, we're getting more news out of Twitter since we told you about those blue check marks. Some new details from an emergency all hands meeting that Elon Musk just had. Why he's saying some company employees reportedly need to get more hardcore. We'll explain. An emergency all-hands meeting just wrapping up over at Twitter, where new owner Elon Musk is reportedly telling employees that, yes, even after layoffs, the company is still overstaffed. Again, even after something like 3,700 people were just let go last week, Musk is taking questions from employees, but uh, maybe short on answers, with New York Times tech reporter Mike Isaac saying that Elon Musk was asked, how are you going to deal with expected attrition and align everybody on a shared vision? Musk's response, I don't know, we all need to be, later adding, we all need to be more hardcore. Um, you, you think, okay, well, what does the Twitter comms department say? Um, a, a lot of them have been laid off, and the New York Times is reporting the top executives responsible for security, privacy, and compliance have resigned. NBC's Jake Ward is all over this story for us and joining us now. And Jake, I know our unit has our hands on an email that Musk sent to employees. I think it was his first email to the entire company. At this time, when there are so many questions about what in the world is going on with this app. That's absolutely right, Hallie. We know that this week was Elon Musk's first direct communication with the staff of Twitter, which means that, right, thousands of them were let go without ever hearing from him directly. Well, in this letter, he painted a picture of very dire times ahead. He basically said, this is the part that I think is most interesting to accept here. Without significant subscription revenue, there is a good chance Twitter will not survive the upcoming economic downturn. He uses the word survive. We need roughly half of our revenue to be subscription. That, of course, as you know, would be a tremendous departure from the business model of Twitter until now, which has been entirely an advertising-based thing. But, you know, on top of that, Holly, I mean, when you just think of all of the things that are in his email inbox right now, right, you're talking about not just all of these difficulties. You're also, you also know that he's receiving the resignation letters of some top executives. CNBC has confirmed that at this point, the head of trust and safety, Yoel Roth, who had been one of the top people actually continuing to carry water for Elon in this new moment, uh, he's gone along with the head uh, of uh, information security, the head of uh, uh, compliance with the FTC, all of these critical people that were keeping Twitter on the good side of the consent so decree that's is... been under since 2011, they're all gone too. His email inbox w makes my makes me sweat to imagine what it's like <laughs> to sit in front of the emails that face Elon Musk right now. Talk about the FTC compliance piece because this is getting a lot of attention. Is it basically a humongous middle finger to like government oversight here? Like, and is it is it problematic for people who actually use Twitter since the FTC is the one responsible for ensuring the company safeguard, for example, privacy? Well, the reason the FTC has been watching Twitter as closely as it has for as long as it has is because, of course, it collects so much important information about all of us, but not just civilians like you and I, also heads of state around the world, right? And their security services, all of these people are on Twitter to some extent at all times. And that means that there's an incredible amount of privileged information inside the service of that company. We know that these chief officers, these top executives, were in large part responsible for making sure that every new rollout of a product feature, every new thing thing that was launched inside Twitter had to be in compliance with that consent decree. But we also know that those people are now gone. They have resigned. And in fact, the scuttlebutt inside Twitter is that people are essentially being told, you're going to have to self-comply. 
basically figure out as you go whether what you are doing is going to put us on the right side or the wrong side of the FTC. That is, of course, why regulators are reportedly looking closely at Twitter at this hour as the people that they were in direct touch with to make sure that they were in compliance go out the door, Hal. Jake Ward, live for us on that story. Jake, thank you. NBC covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, NASA confirmed that divers from a History Channel documentary crew found a large piece, a big piece, of the Space Shuttle Challenger in the ocean off the east coast of Florida. The agency says they were looking for wreckage of a World War II era plane, but found part of the Challenger in the sand instead. Of course, the Challenger was a space shuttle that exploded just after launch in 1986, killing all seven people on board. NASA says it's considering what to do about this discovery that will properly honor the legacy of Challenger's astronauts and their families. From our West Coast Bureau, California lottery officials say they raised more than $150 million for schools in that state. Thanks to that record-breaking Powerball jackpot win this week, California reinvests about 40% of Powerball ticket sales in public schools, so 88 cents for every $2 ticket. State lottery officials are calling it the highest total contribution generated out of a single game drawing in lottery history. From our Northeast Bureau, this year's Rockefeller Center Christmas tree is officially on its way to Manhattan. Check it out. That's a Norway spruce for you tree fans there. Cut down this morning in Queensbury, New York. 82 feet tall, 50 feet wide, 90 years old. The annual tree lighting is going to be November 30th. Still to come. Do you want to live in a house? Do you want to print your house? Maybe your next home could be 3D printed. We have an incredible look at how it gets done in a town. Yes, a town full of these kinds of houses. Our reporter on this says it's the coolest thing she's ever seen. She's going to join us for the backstory right after the break. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And for tonight, we're going to take you to Georgetown, Texas, just north of Austin, where one company recently started building the biggest community of 3D printed homes ever. They're printing a town. You can do this, right? This is how technology is here. You can make real stuff off a printer from this digital three-dimensional file. That is exactly what is happening here, except on a huge scale. Um, I want you to take a look at some of this video. These huge printers, that's them. They're running next to each other, creating each home. That's how it works. It's not a super fast process, but it is super interesting. They're going to build 100 homes like these in that town. So Diana Olick with CNBC went over there. And she, along with her crew, were the first allowed on this site, first members of the media, first reporters allowed here, were using all kinds of, like, really intense and unique software to make this happen. Diana Olick joins us now. Diana, um, I think you are there now. I, I know you've said it's, it's like, one yeah. of the coolest things you've ever seen. Tell us about, pull back the curtain. How did you find out about this story? Tell us more about it. Show it to us. Well, I mean, Hallie, I can't say enough, and I'm not supposed to because I'm a reporter, right, that this is really super cool. But look, I've been to, and I hate to say, more than 100 construction sites over the last two decades or so, and I've never seen anything like this. These are these massive 3D printers. You think of a 3D printer, and you think of maybe a small machine on a desktop that's printing out, you know, dental implants or something like that. But these are literally like toothpaste spitting out four-bedroom homes. You can get a two, three-bedroom, two-bath, four-bedroom, three-bath, whatever you want. And they're doing it all using iPads. And the way we found out about this is, you know, we look at innovation in housing all the time. And I had been talking to Icon, which is a 3D printing company, a couple of years ago. And they were just doing a couple of one-offs, trying some homes for the homeless in Texas. And they said they were going to start talking to a big builder soon. So we were waiting to find out. And then lo and behold, Lennar, which is the second largest builder in America, came to us almost a year ago and said, we are partnering with Icon. And we want to show you these when they get up and running, Hallie. Um, what is it, you know, I have so many, I have like a million questions. Let me ask you, this isn't a very like backstory-ish question, but I have to ask you, like, how scalable is this? In other words, you talk about, you know, the, the, the ability of having some sort of sustainable housing, especially at a time when housing is such a huge issue around the country. Like, is this something that can scale out to sort of the quote unquote real world and not just this little sort of mini town that they're building? 
Absolutely. And this is a 100 home housing development. But that's the whole point here is that it's the first time that they've actually scaled it this large. We were talking to the chairman of Lennar this morning, Stuart Miller, and he was talking about how you start small with this kind of innovation and then you scale it out. And when you have this many 3D printers, obviously getting those big printers out here, getting the so supplies to question, make them, right? that was some you, of the supply chain issues. You probably have to level this site. Like you probably, there's probably things that have to be done. That yeah, have been just like any other site. Like yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but but the cost has got to be way less, right, than you, you, the new construction traditionally. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to, you said that it was slow going. It looks like it's slow going when they're printing them out, but it's actually two to three times faster than building a traditional wow. home. So you can build one, you can print one of these houses in literally two to three weeks, and you're only using maybe three guys as Diana. opposed to a dozen construction workers. Yeah, that that's bananas. what's so crazy about it. And they're you, sitting there using, they don't have nail guns, they have iPads. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. That's how they're building the houses. I love talking about this because you have been our person on the housing market for a long time. You've covered real estate, you cover climate, and here's the story combining the two of them, right? The idea of sustainable real estate and where it may be headed. Yeah, and this is very sustainable because these are all made out of concrete, and so they are very wind resistant, water resistant, mold resistant. They're testing them against hurricane force winds. And climate and real estate go hand in hand. Real estate is actually one of the worst climate offenders out there. 40% of carbon emissions come from real estate. That's how I got climate and real estate together. Diana Olick, it is great to see you. Uh, thank you for bringing us that fascinating story. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for joining us for another 60 Minutes of News right here on Now. We're going to have more of you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.